Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Joanna Cohn. I'm the director of the Institute for Global Tobacco Control, and it is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker in our seminar series, Innovations in Tobacco Control. And our speaker today is Michaeline Fetter. Fetter. She is the Director of Government Relations in the, with the Maryland affiliate of the American Heart Association. So Ms. Fetter started as a school teacher uh, many years ago, was in a school administrator, and then has been with the American Heart Association since 1972. So um, a true expert, I think longer than some of you have been alive. <laughs> so, um, so she's been doing this for a very long time. And, and in her role as Director of Government Relations, uh, she coordinates implements and evaluates the Heart Association's public advocacy um, program locally, federally, and in Maryland. So her work involves advocating for bills, supervising contract lobbyists, uh, working with statewide coalitions, and building relationships with government and health agencies. So today she's going to be talking to us about some of the, I think, campaigns that you're, campaign that you're working on now and previous and learnings from other campaigns. So uh, please join me in welcoming Ms. Michaeline Fetter. Good afternoon, it's lovely to be here. And um, I haven't paid my actors equity dues, so I'm not sure what it's gonna be like to be in a movie without that. But. So I was asked, Rebecca asked me to do two things. One was to talk about our tobacco control movement, and in particular, one piece of legislation that we're working on. And then the second part, which I think is gonna be more fun, is gonna be talking about how we work effectively with members of the government. And that's, that's fun, so let's get through the um, the tobacco part, which is the meat of what we do. Um, call this the, the, uh, the background. This is the background of what we are, what we do. I'm with the American Heart Association, and um, we've, we've, changed, we've changed our goals over the last couple of years, as everybody else has. We used to be an organization that was concerned about getting rid of people's illnesses. And of course, we've gone all the way to the right of that continuum, like everybody else in public health has. And now we're concerned about wellness. We want everybody to be well. And I heard, I heard a remarkable quote from uh, the woman who is our CEO. She said what she would like is for everybody to live a very high quality life for 100 years and wake up the day after the 100th birthday and die. <laughs> Having had a wonderfully happy, healthy life. So we have goals, and we're close to reaching those goals. And we use measurements by CDC, by NIH, by other external groups to determine where we are nationally. So tobacco control, of course, is a major issue for the American Heart Association because it's related to so many illnesses. Uh, and AHA has determined there are four major areas in which to work, one of them being brand new. So the first thing we have to deal with is high tobacco taxes. That's one of the things that they ask us to, to work towards. Comprehensive clean indoor air, adequate funding for tobacco use, and the newest one is called Tobacco 21. So let's, let's talk about tobacco tax first because we're, Maryland is in really good shape compared to a lot of the, of the rest of the country. And part of that is because we don't have too much in the way of tobacco growing. We did at one time, and we've gotten rid of most of it. So it's easier for us to, to do well in a lot of the tobacco issues. And it's kind of fun for me because I'm in a region that includes North Carolina, South Carolina, and Virginia. And we go to meetings in Virginia, and across the road from where we turn into our office is a big tobacco industry, big company. So this is what we've got. We now have a $2 tobacco tax, and we reach that in a few different stages, which you can see up there. Um, in 1999, we had a campaign from the baseline to increase 30 cents at that point. And 30 cents has been deemed the, the minimum increase that really will be effective. If you increase it a penny or two pennies, the change is not going to be noticed by anybody. But it, you need to do at least 30 cents. So we did 30 cents at that point. Then we went back in 2000 and we did 34 cents. And then the big one was in 2008. And that's when we got the dollar, the dollar tax added. 
So now we're at $2 a package. And when we first got to $2 a package, we were one of the heroes in the whole country because we were, I think, with the third highest tax. But now we're down to 13. The highest tax is in New York. They have $4.35 on a package of cigarettes. And Missouri, the state of Missouri only has 17 cents, which is outrageous. So we, we've tried periodically to increase that tax. Um, we put in a bill last year, which was the dumbest thing anybody could do because we have a new governor who ran on no new taxes. So we gave it a try, it didn't work, and we sort of dropped it. So that's where we are. We're doing relatively well, but we'd like to get a little bit better. I don't think we'll ever come to the 434, but we can, we can do better. Um, comprehensive clean under air, we're also one of the heroes of the whole country. We passed very, very, very comprehensive clean indoor air legislation in 2007 that became effective in uh, February 2008. We have no smoking in all indoor work sites. We have no smoking in bars and restaurants, and the bars were the hardest thing to get. And when I, I wrote here, um, the sky never fell down. We had, I think we took six or seven years to pass that legislation, and the opponents were the, the bar owners and restaurateurs. And they would come with every permutation of crying and sucking their thumb and stamping their feet. If we pass this legislation, the children of their workers will have no, no shoes. Nobody will ever come to a bar again. One man came up and he said that his, one of his workers just bought a new car and he's going to have to default on payments because if we pass this, nobody will come to bars. Well, I think if you look now at bars, you see, you see um, that they are very well um, attended. And I'm going to talk later when we get into the second part about a major theme that I believe in, which is don't confuse me with facts. You'll hear this over and over again. Because they knew the facts. When the facts are that more people don't smoke than do, and if they took the time to figure out what that meant, that people who would never come into their bar before are coming in now, they would realize that the facts show that they're going to be fine. But they were working purely on emotion. They were working purely on emotion. And bill passed, the regulations passed, they had an opt-out. We did have, a, <laughs> when we did the regulations, we put in a capability of anybody filling out a f set of forms, which were probably this high, to request to be excluded from the law. Nobody filled it out. It was so onerous that uh, nobody filled it out. And no bars went out of restaurants, went out of business, and we have a really good law here. And the, the name of this was, um, a moving target. So I say that with regard to this legislation because last year we had to fend off a seriously bitter moving target. A new gambling casino was opening up in Prince George's County and the owner of the gambling casino wanted to put cigar smoking places inside. And we got mildly hysterical, all the tobacco control people got on the phone, and we were back and forth, what are we going to do, how are we going to stop this? And we came up with an approach. And the approach was almost a civil rights approach, because we said that if they were allowed to have their tobacco areas, their cigar smoking areas, that it would put the people who were serving in those areas at risk, and they would be the only people in the state who were not protected, the only workers in the state who were not protected from tobacco use, and that, and that did it. it. It was in the bill, it got amended out, and we, we saved the day. But these kinds of things happen continuously. We're always, always looking for people to find a chink and go through it. Okay, Tobacco 21 is our, our newest, newest initiative. And um, I, I was sort of against it when I first heard about it because I thought to myself, well, if we can send these kids off to war to lose limbs, to die, how can we tell them they can't smoke? I mean, we send them at 18. It seemed ridiculous. But I just came back from the American Public Health Association meeting. Anybody there? Anybody from this group, Bill? And I went to a session. There were two, two exhibits by organizations that are promoting this. One was a, a law clinic, a national uh, public health law clinic. And the other one was just a general tobacco control organization. And then there was a session. And at the session, we heard from from people who had already worked on this and had passed it. One was in the state of Hawaii, uh, the others were local municipalities. But 
the justification was twofold. Um, one is up there. If, if we can keep a child from smoking up until age 21, all of the data show that that child will never start to smoke. The minimum, minimal capability of that child starting to smoke. So that's one of the motivations. But the other one that I hadn't thought about was the fact that now there are 18-year-olds in high school. When I went to school, you were out, you were 17 in two days. You had to be out of school. Now they have different cutoff dates and kids go to preschool. So you've got older children and the 18-year-olds can legally buy tobacco products. And while we know that kids who are motivated to get tobacco products will find some way to get it, buy it, steal it, get somebody to get it, but this is just adding to it. So, so if we can get this legislation passed, then the likelihood is that we will keep many kids from, from starting. So we're just getting organized. We, um, we have a, a nucleus of a subcommittee to work on it, including somebody representing the Attorney General's office, one of the chief counsels. We have our tobacco law clinic. We have Cancer, Lung, Heart, March of Dimes. We have an organization called Macho. Anybody know what Macho is? The Maryland Association of County Health Officers who are very interested in supporting this. And we have another group that I'm going to tell you about. Is Hussein here? He's not here. All right. There's a, there's a group that I'll tell you about later called the Young Professional Chronic Disease Network. What's oh, so what should I do? Right there. Okay. Good. Okay. So I'll, we'll tell you about that later. And Hussein said he was going to drop by, and I thought he would tell you about it. So we're starting with this. We're going to put in legislation this year. Um, some controversy about who should be penalized. The Heart Association and all the voluntaries don't think that the child, the user, the person who um, is, is smoking under 18 should be penalized. We think that the vendor, the owner of the company, of, of the store that sells them should be penalized. Some people think otherwise, so we have to work that out. Um, okay, now, here comes the one that is really exciting. We're working on, on, a, on a piece of legislation, but we're gonna try to do it without legislation first. And let me give you the history of, of trying to get money for prevention um, and cessation, tobacco use prevention and cessation. How many of you are familiar with the tobacco settlement, with, with the fact that 26 states settled with all of the major tobacco industries to recover the amount of money that they claim was spent by the state for Medicaid payments related to tobacco use diseases. So you, there was an iconic picture, I remember all of the five tobacco moguls standing in front of, of, of one of the congressional committees and they were asked did they have any idea that what they were selling was harmful and everyone said no. Had no idea it was harmful, they had no idea people were getting sick. So. In any event, it, it, it happened. So the states all got a huge amount of money, and there were no restrictions placed on this money. So the states could do whatever they wanted to do with this money. Now, morally, you would think that if we got this money for the purpose of keeping people from getting sick from tobacco use, we might use this money for prevention programs. But that, nobody, nobody really felt the urgency to do that. In fact, my favorite situation is the state that bought a morgue. They built a whole new morgue with their money. And they said they did that because most of the people coming in the morgue are there because of smoking tobacco issues, smoking tobacco cigarettes. So, so in any event, what we did the first year, the first year that, that we had the tobacco money, um, and, and you can see up there that we get about $520 million a year. There was a basic amount, and then there was, there was interest, and there was more money that came in. So. The first year, under Glenn Denning, under Governor Paris Glenn Denning, anybody remember him? He was, he was very, very much supportive of, of doing away with tobacco use and preventing children particularly. So he put $30 million, $30 million in his budget the first year, and um, now it has dwindled down. First year was, 2000, now 16 years later, there is $8.7 million in the budget, and I wrote 10 million, and I did that because 8.7 million of it came from the tobacco settlement money, and the other 
to make up the difference came from another pool of money. But essentially, the tobacco settlement dollars went from 30 million for programs to 8.7 million. And that's with Maryland getting 520 million a year from a combination of tobacco taxes and cigarette, rest cigarette restitution fund is the name that they use in the budget line for the state health department. That's where all the money comes in and it's parceled out. Um, and, and that's only spending 10 million or 8.7 million a year is outrageous because the, the industry, industry spends $134 million a year in Maryland alone marketing products to people in this state. And of course part of the tobacco settlement um, requirements were that they, they couldn't do a whole certain, certain kinds of marketing, but if there was a little crack in a window, they figured out how to get through it. One of, one of the requirements was that they couldn't have signs on windows beyond, I don't know, 12 by 18, something like that. So they made smaller signs. They made a whole load of them. They made a whole lot of smaller signs, and they just spread it all out. So they were, they were adhering to the letter of the law, but not what the law really was all about. They made the signs smaller than they could, but the same, they had more of them, the windows were covered, so that's the kind of thing that they do. So we have to counteract that, and we can't do it without, without money. So at the time that we got this tobacco settlement money, the Centers for Disease Control, in its infinite wisdom, decided that it ought to get involved and try and help us, those of us who were using any of the money for tobacco use prevention and cessation, uh, some, some sort of a program for how to use that money. And they came up with a plan. It, it covered every single state. They took in each of the areas, and I have um, community education, school education, vendor, vendor monitoring, uh, and so forth. They went around the country, and they found what states were doing the best job in each one of these areas, and they used that as a best practice. They, they were able to find the cost per person for each one of these programs, how much it costs per person in this wonderful state to do community education, how much for cessation, how much for surveillance, and so forth. And they came up with a plan for every state. And um, they had a minimum at first and a maximum. And our minimum in Maryland was 21 million. So the second year, the 30 million was reduced down to 21, but the governor put it in his budget, which is very unusual. Usually it comes out of a general fund and then it's, it's, it's put in that way. But he put a specific line item for $21 million into his budget. And um, wh what's interesting too about these programs is that they all have to work together. If you take one out, if, if you do community education, but you don't monitor the vendors and, and the vendors can sell to whoever they want, you've lost it. Um, if you don't do cessation, but you have community education and you motivate people to want to do something about their smoking habit, but you don't have anything for them to do, then you've lost it too. So in Maryland, the combination of, of the fact that we had $21 million to do all of these things, and at the same time, we were increasing the tax. So we did incredibly well in, in reducing tobacco use in Maryland. We did better than the national average. So we're at a point now where we are losing we're losing the battle, not with cigarettes. People are st stopping cigarette use, but where are they, what are they doing instead? They're using the e-cigarettes, the electronic cigarettes, and the vaping. So uh, there's an increase, in, a tremendous increase in vaping, which more than matches the reduction. So we can't really look at those, those usage numbers and get excited that there are fewer people smoking. So we... Um, we pulled together all of the organizations, we have probably about 50 of them now, but again, run by heart, lung, cancer, um, and the, the usual suspects. And we came up with a, with a plan to try and convince this governor, who ran on no new taxes, um, who just took, I think, an $80 million hit to the budget. Was that what it was? I think it was just announced that he had to take $80 million out of the budget, or more, something around there, because the taxes were not coming in as they had hoped. So. We are going to try and convince Governor Hogan that he needs to put back $21 million because our programs are not working and we need to have a component now to get rid of these e-cigarettes. So with brainstorming, we all have communications people who are very creative 
and they came up with the idea of appealing to to Governor Hogan's um, health issues. I think you probably all know it was common knowledge that shortly after he took office, he was diagnosed with um, non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. And while he was in treatment, he met a lot of children that were also in, in treatment, and he, um, he befriended them. He went out of his way to befriend them. And I had remembered this in my head, but I went back and checked the, some of the newspaper clippings. And the kind of thing he did was when he went to Ocean City, uh, he knew that there were a couple of condos that were purchased by some, some organization, specifically for children and families with children who had cancer. And he went and he visited these kids, and he made a vow that he, he just didn't, he wanted to do what he could to prevent children from, from having to have cancer. And so we're appealing to that, and we're, we're using the, the theme that we want him to put the money back because this will prevent, if we do enough education, this will prevent children from starting to smoke and having to go through the horrible, the horrible situation that he went through. So we're launching the campaign, and, and the hashtag is Hogan Be Our Hero. That's what I have up there, Hogan Be Our Hero. And the ask is going to be for him to, to voluntarily, although it won't be voluntary, but it will, put, put $21 million <laughs> into the budget. The backup plan is if he doesn't do it, by the time he, he submits the budget, then we're going to do the same thing with legislation. We have a bill ready to go. So we're kicking this off um, Thursday, 10 o'clock. We have a physician, a legislator. We have um, some patients. We have some people in the public, a whole, a whole campaign with a press conference. All the press is coming. And it's right, around, it's right around here. It's on uh, South Caroline Street, and you're all welcome to join us. So that is where we are. Um, and, and we would hope that groups like yours would get involved in some of these campaigns. These are all in sync, I think, with what you're, what you're learning, how to, prevent, how to prevent disease, how to, how to maintain good health. So if you're interested in getting involved at all, there are couple of ideas that, that I just put in here. You can use your social media. We, we provide, when I say we, heart, you can call heart, you can call cancer. Uh, we'll provide samples of tweets that you can use. We'll give you little articles that you can put on your social media, which would be a way to support this. Um, you could do letters to the editors. You could testify at hearings. The hearings are all uh, publicly announced. And anybody who would like the excitement of coming and standing before a committee that doesn't want what you want to sell <laughs> is, is it, it's really a very interesting experience. It really, really is. Um, even just coming to a hearing and, and filling the room up is, is important, letting people know that you're there because you support this legislation. Um, and this, this yeah, Jose still didn't come in. There's a group, he, Jose um, is somebody who's studying here in school. And he has an or he's part of a national organization, an international organization called Young Professional Chronic Disease Network. I don't know if any of you have heard about it, but they are mobilizing all over the world, he says, to support legislation. He was particularly interested in this tobacco twenty one. So he and his his partner is someone named Mia. Mia Young. Anybody know her? So if you're interested, just leave word with uh, with Rebecca or somebody and we'll get you in touch with them. So there's a lot of room for you to get involved in this, but you need to know how to deal with your legislators. So here we go. How are we doing with time? We're good. Um, I, I told you my, my own personal favorite cute, uh, quote. Don't confuse me with facts. In trying to move forward a piece of legislation, you don't even put the facts in the body of the testimony. You just attach them. They know the data. The tobacco people know how deleterious it is. They know the statistics. They know how bad the air quality is. They know it all. They choose to ignore it, and they vote based on all kinds of other situations. Um, and I, I love Yogi Berra. I think he's one of the best um, commentators, one of the best philosophers. He said, "Never." He said, "90% of the game is half mental," and that's. That's what you basically have when you're dealing with the legislature. You have to figure out how to outwit them. What's, what is going to be an argument that, that you need to, to, to work through to get to, to the individual person? You've got to really, really do that. Um, and you have to establish a connection. So, I mean, I have been 
we, we all do research. If you're going before a particular committee, and I have this in a later slide, so I'll do it now. We can go past that one quickly. But when you look at a committee that you're bringing a piece of legislation before, you put them in three groups. One group is those who are always with you. They're the, they're the ones who believe in their gut in public health, and no matter what you do, they will support your legislation. With those people, and you can look at Wisconsin as a model in this past, gener this past election, you can't ignore them. You can't just as assume that they're going to be with you. You have to thank them and give them a little loving here and now, notes and whatever, but you don't have to do too much with them. And then there are always a couple at the other end of the spectrum who no matter what you do, no matter what data, what convincing you do with them, they're not going to vote your way because of, of, of ideology. So you, do, you don't even bother with them. We've just learned that. And then there are those in the middle who were uncommitted, and they're the ones that we really focus on. We get to know them, we do, we do in-depth research on them, and you, you, you try and find something to connect them to the issue. Um, I've played the, the grandparent card. You know, I know you just had a grandchild, isn't it wonderful, and just sitting and chatting, and um, I know you belong to this church, and I have friends, and it's wonderful. You have to get in, inside of them. You have to get to, to where do they live? I call this the power of constituency. Um, legislators are just, they're just people. You can find them in the supermarket. I mean, they go to the store, they go to the dentist. I put the quotation mark, I mean, the question mark there because some of them are a little weird, that's, that's, that's true. But for the most part, they're part of your community. And a lot of, a lot of people that we recruit are nervous about, how can I go before this group? I mean, they're all famous, blah, blah, blah. But, but if you think of them as individuals who live a, live a life, they all, many of them have jobs, some of them are career. Uh, you probably know that in Maryland, the General Assembly is 90 days, that's it. Every year, 90 days, the second Wednesday in January, it opens, it closes the second Monday in April, and for those 90 days, they're all full-time legislative. But many of them, one, one of the members has a jewelry store right on Main Street in Annapolis, another one owns a restaurant, uh, a couple doctors, a couple lawyers, a couple pharmacists. So they really are, and, and we hope that you would, you would understand that it's, they're, they're not too difficult to talk with once you get it get past your head. Um, but you, the constituency is important because you're really their boss. You are really their boss. You elect them to their job. We have the General Assembly and the governor and, and all of them, the people in Annapolis are voted in every four years. We have four-year terms, and each year you can play a different, a different approach. The first year of a new group, um, they don't like to make any waves. The second year and the third year, they're really, you know, they can do it all. And the fourth year, they're back in campaign mode. And so if you go to see them, you need to say, I'm in your district. And this is important to me, to my family. I belong to that neighborhood association also in your district. And they listen. In fact, many of them, if you write a letter, the first thing they'll do is have their staff look at the address, and if the address is not in their district, they won't even look at it. So, so as a constituent, you have a lot, a lot of sway. Um, you need to position every issue in terms of how, it, how it's going to play in, in that person's district. And we can't do this to everybody, but we go committee by committee, and, and we look at who the who the people are we have to convince. And, and we, we focus on recruiting a lot of people. And, and we tell stories. Um, putting a face on the issue is, is pretty much what, what you do. That's the, the easiest way to explain it. Um, when we were doing clean indoor air, we had one holdout on one committee. And the legislator was from Prince George's County. And he was not convinced at all by the data after six years of hearing it. So we finally turned him by bringing in a whole slew of students from University of Maryland at College Park who had to work to maintain themselves in school and to keep up with their classes. The only place they could work were in bars, in the neighborhood bars, because those hours worked with theirs. And these kids came in and one after the other told the story about coming home from work with their eyes tearing with their clothes reeking and they had to put them out on the porch or, or whatever. And each one told a real story. These were in his district 
real stories, and this is what got him to vote for it. This was a, the last vote we had, and we knew that he was interested in people. I mean, you have to be, I guess, to be a legislator, but and that's, that's, what, that's what turned it around. So you have to make the issue emotional, and you have to find somebody in their district, or more somebodies, who can talk to the issue from a personal experience. Now, th this is an interesting question. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to open this up for anybody to, ask that to answer the question. Do you know what the only goal is in the life of a sitting legislator? That's it. The only thing he wants to do is to get reelected. And if he's not reelected, and, and this was first told to us by somebody in Congress at a national meeting we went to, he said it's like he got fired in front of everybody that you know. You walk into the supermarket, everybody says, oh, look at him, he didn't get his job back. You go take your kid to school, the bus driver knows you didn't get the job back. You go, wherever you go, in your neighborhood, right after the election, and, and it's humiliating, and they want to go out on their own terms, and so they will do whatever it takes for you to put them in. And that, again, we're going to go right back to where we started a few minutes ago. They need to please their constituents. So the more of their constituents they hear from on an issue, the more they're going to be motivated. But that, that's something to always remember if you're going to work in the legislative arena. Um, this was an issue that, that we talked about before. How do you choose? How do you choose an issue that you want to get behind? How do we do it? How do we do it? Um, the first thing I was told when I started doing lobbying was by a a legislator who's a seasoned, a seasoned gentleman, and he said, look, he said, when you come to me with a bill, before you tell me anything else, you have to tell me what is wrong that this bill is going to fix. I don't want to hear anything unless it's going to do something for my people. What is wrong now that this bill will fix? So we have to think of that as, as the basis for what we do. But anything that we do has to have its basis in science. We will not take on an issue unless even though they don't pay attention to the facts, but, but we, we still need to know that there are facts basing, basing the, the issue on, on, the legislation on. So we're doing a lot of work now in sugar, trying to, to keep children from, from consuming sugary drinks. But we have bodies of evidence that, that talk about the relationship between sugar-loaded sugar sodas and kids' illnesses. Um, tobacco, again, we, have, we know about air quality, we, we know about um, the actual effect on the smoker, we know about how it exacerbates certain other things, we know about kids and tobacco, we know, so, so we're comfortable working in that area. Um, the next thing that you need is to have a constituency around you. You need to have other people, no one organization, including ours, which has thousands of members, no one organization can pass, a legi can pass legislation on, on its own. You need to bring together all like-minded organizations. And, and when you're working in the field for 45 years, you, you get to know. It's like a big family because we're, we're all, it's a small state and we're all very close. And we sometimes will go to a meeting and we'll say, hey, what meeting is this? <laughs> because many of us come together for many different issues. But, but um, the, the basic the basic situation here is that you need to know that you're not going to be alone in fighting this. You're going to need to know that you have other groups that are going to work with you, going to help you plan, going to share resources with you. And the resources becomes another issue. Um, do, you have, do you have enough people? Do you have enough people even in, in your own organization to, to do what needs to be done? Do you have the money? What, what are the costs going to be to do this? And, and can, you, can you handle the cost? Um, this next one is interesting. Is this the political, politically correct time to put this issue forth? And I told you before that we put forth a tobacco tax increase last year. It was not the right time to do it. And we knew it, but we sort of wanted to try it out. But when you know a governor has run on no new taxes, you don't go in and ask for a tobacco tax because it's not the right time. Um, you've got to be aware of the budget, what's happening with the budget. And this, there are some years where we're told Unless you have a fiscal note of $2.50, don't even bring it to me. And, and the fiscal note is really what they base a whole lot of their decisions on. How much is it going to cost? So we have good years tax-wise, bad years tax-wise. But if it's a year that they're really struggling um, 
to, to pay everything that they're committed to paying. It's not a year that you go in with a big, with a big fiscal note. Um, we, we were trying to get, a couple of years back, for several years, trying to get the schools to commit to 150 minutes of PE, physical education, for elementary school students. And the first time it just died. The second time they were very nice. They, um, they threw us a bone and they let us have a summer study group, which is clearly the kiss of death. But we put together, it was chaired by a delegate and a senator, and we put together a really good report. And in the report, we looked at who had done what before. Has this happened in any other state? We looked at um, what the current status is of the different school districts in terms of what they're doing in PE. And then we costed out, knowing the baseline for each state, for each county, we costed out what it would take to give every school district what it needed to do 150 minutes a week. And that came to far less than they were paying now for obesity-related illnesses. I mean, we showed them, these are the data, we showed them how we got, don't confuse me with facts. So, again, you have to look at the, at, at the right time to do it. Um, the concept of a champion is very, very important because we're all external people. We're, we're, I'm a hired hack, you know, they pay me at the Heart Association to, to try and get these laws passed, but you need to get somebody from within their own system. You need to find a legislator who is passionate about your issue who will be your inside person. And that sometimes is not easy to do. Sometimes it's very easy to do. Sometimes they just emerge because you know the way they vote. Other times you need to pick one or two people and, 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 and work with them and get them to really take it on. But it's a critical factor in passing a bill. And then you want to know what's happened with this bill before. Has it been introduced before? What was the fate? Was it voted on? Was it not voted on? There are some committee chairmen that are famous for leaving bills that they don't like in their drawer and never pulling them out. So some of them have hearings and they never get voted on. Um, sometimes they'll organize a vote only if they know that it's going to be defeated or if it passed, whatever they want to happen. But you need to know that background because if, if you're going to the same committee and it hasn't changed and the bill is the same, you're going to get what you always got. You know, if you always do what you always did, you have to come up with either waiting for another election when there'll be different people on the committee or change the, change the bill a little bit, do something to change the bill. Um, and then finally, and this is also critical, who's working against you? Th there will be people who will be on the other side of the issue. With tobacco, it's the tobacco industry. With sugar, the sugar bills, it's the, it's the Associated Beverage, Licensed Beverage Association. And you need to research what they're doing, what they're saying, and what their arguments are. And if there's past history, you need to look at testimony. And then you need to decide how you're going to counter that. You need to preempt. So these are, these, are all, these are all issues that you need to think about before you decide to take on a bill. And that is um, the, the three committees I told you about, how you divide up a committee. And you know, I think you probably all know how a bill becomes a law. You have to, you have, to have a, a hearing that, with the bill before the House committee, before the Senate committee, and each of the committees has subcommittees. So usually you have to do the subcommittee, then you do the committee, and then you're not done yet, even if it passes out of the co one committee. The second committee could amend it, and then it's a different bill, and it has to go back to the first committee. So before it even goes on the floor of the House, before the House, so the floor of the Senate. So you've, you've got to deal with each one of those. And then if you get it out of the House and you get it out of the Senate, you still have another opportunity for screwing up, and that's will the governor sign it. And we've had bills, we've had bills that the governor has refused to sign. <laughs> the, one, the one that comes to mind is the, um, the fact that the, the, the legislation that created walking as the official state exercise, you know about that? If you, if you go on the government page, there's a, official designations, and we had a piece of legislation passed that called walking the state exercise. And that was kind of funny because, do you all know what Smith Island cake is? Well, Smith Island cake is also now the official cake of Maryland. And these two bills, the second time, the first time the governor vetoed it, and we knew why, because he didn't like the sponsor and it was a, a governor that we knew was leaving, so we just waited until he was gone and we put it through again. But the second time, 
these two bells were always heard together, the cake bell and the walking bell. And you can imagine what fun we had with that. Oh, you'll eat the cake and then you'll walk. And permutations thereof. But both of the bills passed. And if you look at all the designations, there were about 20 or 25 official designations, but walking is the state exercise. In fact, they, have, they just had in October a walking day, a state walking day where they got the governor involved and, and all the, the, the Department of Education and the health department all stood behind it. So um, I think that's, that's probably what you need to do to get legislation passed, work with the committees. I think for the most part, oh, here's one more. Um, if you want to learn more about the workings, the workings of the General Assembly, they have a, an incredible website. All you do is Google, because Google I put at the end, that's, you can get anything by Googling. If you Google Maryland General Assembly, you will get to the, the website. And their website gives you, it gives you ongoing information about the bill. If, if they're in session, it will, you, can, you can tag it to tell you whenever an amendment comes on, whenever there are hearings on the bill. Um, who the sponsors are. You can get information about every one of the legislators on that bill. You can get history on the bill. It, it, it's on, on, on the, the members of the General Assembly. It's an incredible website. And it's just fun to play with it. The first time you see it for about an hour or two and just click around and see what it does. And the, Verizon has put out an app. And again, if you go to the app on your smartphone and you put in Verizon MGA, it'll get to it. And you have it on your phone, which I have, and it, it will tell you who the committees are, when the votes are, it'll tell you background on every one of the members. So that's, that's really exciting. Um, AHA has a, a program called You're the Cure, Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, and it's our legislative network. And, and many, of, many of the public health organizations have this. You can sign up, it costs nothing to sign up, and what happens is when we're working a bill, we put an alert into the system. We have somebody who manages this. And when we're ready, they can push it, and it'll go out to the constituents of the people that we need to get to. It's totally targeted within the system. And if you get that, all you have to do is click it, and it gets your name on it, and it goes. Or you have the opportunity to add some comments to it. But we like nothing better than to be told, stop them from coming, you got my vote. Because sometimes we really flood, we flood them. So if you're interested in joining that, just, it, it, just go in yourthecure.org and it'll bring you to it. It takes 12 seconds to sign up. You can do it on your phone. Um, the Campaign for Tobacco Free Kids. How many of you have heard about that? That's an amazing organization based in Washington. They are a site that does support for everything we do in tobacco control and they maintain the most magnificent records of anything that you want to know. When I wanted to know what place we were in in terms of um, taxes, they, every month they update their stuff. So we have that. They have a whole background for every state of how much money since 2000 every state put into, into tobacco control efforts it matched against how much they got. Um, they can tell you, give you a whole sheet if you put in Campaign for Tobacco for Kids, Maryland data. It will give you a two-page data set of everything you want to know, current, up to the minute. I just pulled one this morning as of November 1. Every statistic you would want to know about tobacco use here. Um, there's an organization that, that is partially funded by AHA and partially by Robert Wood Johnson. And it's called Voices for Healthy Kids. And the purpose of this group is to reduce childhood obesity. But they have a, an amazing website and they have information about a load of different programs that you do from corner stores, which I know uh, there's a center working on here. Um, they have information on, on walking paths, how to do safe routes to school, um, how, to, how to organize a vending, healthy vending campaign. But they, it's a wonderful resource. And then, as I said, Google, Google, Google. Anything you want to know, you just ask it. You just ask it. I'd, I just got a gift from my daughter's neighbor of sour candy from her neighbor who lives in Australia, and I was trying to figure out the calories, and it's all written in Australia, Australian measurements. So I just said, how many ounces are in, and what this thing was, and it told me immediately. So Google is magic. Anyway, that's all I have to say, and I am ready for your, um, your questions. No questions, lunch, okay. Yes. 
meetings with other sort of um, NGOs and other players and stakeholders. I'm curious in your um, experiences how well other NGOs work with other NGOs. I mean, in, in some cases you have a very common um, goal, but in, in some cases I can imagine it gets crowded in, in terms of people wanting to be the NGO for that cause. So have you learned anything in, in sort of how yeah. to navigate that? You have to when you work in coalitions. And, and what you have to learn is that everybody brings something different to the table. And nobody's organization is less important than somebody else's organization. So you may have a bill and you may say, um, we need to do some, some uh, polling, some, some telephone canvassing. Anybody have money to do it? And somebody will say, yeah, I can do that. They may do that, but they may not sign on to a, to a form. Um, they may let you put their name on a letterhead, but they may not want to come to meetings. They, they will do whatever you want them to do, but don't bother me with meetings. You give me an assignment, and so you have to recognize that, and you cannot use the one rule for everybody. We have situations where we have to deal with putting out a statement in terms of a coalition, and not everybody wants their name connected to that statement. On the other hand, the coalition may not choose to work in an area that we're working in. So we can do anything on our own, but once our name is on the, on the press release, that signifies that we have agreed to that. So again, the, the, the short answer to your question is you have to accept the differences between and among groups. And of course, you don't go out to a group that it doesn't have some sort of an inclination to be involved. Um, when I was in, in Denver at APHA a couple of weeks ago, one of the presentations was made by a gentleman from, a, I forget which, which county was, in a small state in, in the Midwest. He represented the Chamber of Commerce. And he said to, to the group, it was a group about this size, and he said, how many of you here are in public health? So we raised our hands. How many of you are here representing Chambers of Commerce? Nobody. And he, in his 15 minutes, convinced us that we needed to get together with the Chamber of Commerce. That's an, that's a, it's a dimension that we had never thought about because their concern is to keep their insurance rates down. And their, their concern is also to make sure that their, their workers are as healthy as they can be and they want to reduce absenteeism. So you can appeal to them on what's important to them. And we just never thought about that. So it's going to be a, a new experience for us to give you a, a different answer maybe next month, but we're going to try it. So I hope that helped. Yes? So you had talked about the four-year kind of lifespan of a sitting legislator right. and the first year being the always waiting until they're in the we, We're not permitted. We're what's known as a 501c3. That means we're tax deductible for anybody who contributes to us, and we don't pay taxes. But part of the deal to get that is that we cannot be perceived as being biased in any way towards or against any candidate. We are just not permitted. So the year of an election, you know, we, our fundraisers, I, I, I spend money, I don't raise it, but the, the fund, fundraisers love to get a legislator to come to an event. And if it's the year of an election, the answer is absolutely no. If it's a year before or whatever, um, there's a possibility, but then we have to offer the same opportunity to everybody else, either on a committee, some, some group. And, and you have that when you do an event in Annapolis, too. You can't invite one person. You can invite a group. You can invite either a committee or a caucus. There's a black caucus. There's a women's caucus. I think that's it. Um, you can invite the whole House, the whole Senate. And it's the same thing when we invite somebody. They may choose not to go. You may have one person on a committee that wants to go and you invite everybody else and nobody else may want to go, but you have to document that you gave them the opportunity. So the, the, again, the short answer is we're not permitted. And for folks like me, um, you know, people work very, very hard to give us the right to vote. And you could say, well, I can vote, or I can not vote, but I can go and I can, elect, I can, I can be at a campaign as me and not as me with my heart hat on, but I'm known in the community as being connected to the Heart Association. That doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me. And that's something we have to be very sensitive about because I don't want to give the perception that I'm supporting a candidate. That answer? Okay. Yes, ma'am. 
the hookah. Right, you're, you're absolutely right. And I, I, when we looked at all the things that have to be in place before we can support an issue, one of them is you need to have good, good data. And we don't have any prospective data. But there are certain things that we do know. One thing we know is that since these um, e-cigarettes have been out, and you know they have all these flavors that you put in them, the, the, um, um, the pharmacies, the, the, what do you call them? The, 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 emergency, the emergency rooms, and, and the, the, there's a special name for them. Urgent, urgent care and emergency rooms are getting more and more kids coming in with, with po being poisoned. We have data, we have data from, from Maryland here showing that, that there's a, a majorly statistically significant increase in the number of children who are seeing these flavors and they're, and they're, they're drinking them. You, you, you're familiar with that. So we know that. We can document that. Um, and this is true all over the country. The other thing that we can document is that some of these things are exploding. Um, there's a heat factor and if they're not made well and we can document that but we still don't know what the long-term effect is and, and they've sprung up a whole, a whole gaggle of um, salespeople now who are going around to the various hearings and they're <laughs> we had a hearing in Howard County a year ago this summer and one of these guys actually told me when I was testifying that um, you can't believe the Heart Association. They, their, their data aren't good. And what they claim, what they claim is that people um, are better off smoking these hookahs and these e-cigarettes. These e it's safer for them than regular cigarettes. But what studies, little studies we do have, show that people are not using them instead. They're using them only when they're in environments where they can't smoke. So they'll use that in a restaurant. But now... Airplanes are not permitting them. A lot of restaurants are not permitting them. So they're, they're not using them as an alternative. They're using them in addition. But we're just not on good, on good ground. I mean, these guys can say whatever they want. We have a reputation and they don't. But it's, it's troublesome. It's, it's very troublesome. And we've tried to get legislation. In Baltimore City, we tried to get a, a, an e-cigarette bill passed. And they just did a number. They did an absolute number. The, the industry did an absolute number on them. And... Um, it, it, it died, yes. But FDA now with a deeming rule, yeah. they now, it's now under, under their auspices and I don't know exactly what they can do. I don't, they've not done the regulations yet, but we know that as of I think September, uh, the deeming rule went into effect, and it gives them the right to control electronic products. So it's a, it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. When, when, we were, when we were working on that bill in Howard County, which did, it did pass in Howard County, um, these, this one guy in particular, with all of his henchmen around him, with one that was saying that we don't have any credibility, um, it was 12.30 at night, Almost everybody had gone home except a few of us on this bill. And they did that intentionally, you know, to, to, to wear us out. But um, I didn't want to get back up, which I could have, but it was, they were glazing over. But for the next week, every night, I sent one article. I emailed one article to every member of the council, a different article about what we knew. I mean, it was about the, the, um, the emergency room visits. It was about the exploding. Um, another, another thing, in the New York Times, if you Google uh, e-cigarettes in New York Times, they had an article about a year and a half ago about uh, those that are produced in China and under terrible conditions, and there, there, there's no, you've, you've seen that, no, no regulation, no sanitary conditions. So everything we could possibly pull together, they got, and they voted, when the vote came, they supported us. Yes, ma'am. Very difficult to do this with a uh, with, with with a private. Oh, okay. With 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 a private. In my case, I've been to the and always. I go to the, the head of the condo association, who's also a friend, a friend of mine, a friend of the other ladies, and I said, "What what can we do so she so she won't know that that I'm doing it?" 
So they actually supported me. They had somebody come in and do a quality air quality, but in the whole in the whole building, and they determined that the air quality in my hall was worse. That they didn't do anything after that. Sure. Okay. So um, here we go. So um, Michaelene is able to stay a little bit after for more questions. I know we just have to vacate the room, um, but I want please join me in thanking Michaelene for a great presentation.